I do have um, I do have Zoom going, and I'm recording these, so if you need to access them later. Now the microphone is right here, so I'm probably going to run back over here every time I want to talk. So if you're ever sitting here, that's why I'm doing that. So feel you know, let me know if I'm shouting at you. <laughs> A um, couple of reminders here. Um, so Friday, you have assignment two, number due. Assignment two is due. Uh, so if you haven't uh, been working hard on that, uh, now's the time to get cracking. Uh, I'm hoping to hand out assignment three on Friday as well. And uh, it'll be kind of the same thing. We'll have about four weeks to do it. So I think we have lots of time next month to talk to Uh I thought there was something else I was going to say. Um, oh, maybe I'll remember in a few minutes. So we were talking about proteins. And I think we finished off roughly around here. We we're talking about different protein kind of sources. And uh, there's different ways to rate protein. We can talk about animal sources. Animal sources tend to be more digestible and getting more amino acids out of them, usually complete amino acids, those kind of things. Uh, but you can you can get good proteins out of plants. And uh, you know, we just want to make sure if you are going plant-based diet that you are getting a good balance. And so I want to kind of come back and talk about that in a minute. There's a couple other things to sort of uh, talk about. I want to talk about vegetarianism uh, in a few minutes here. Uh, there's a couple other things I was looking at and something that I feel like the textbook had completely ignored is gluten. Um, I was looking for it all over the textbook. It mentions it a few times, but gluten is a protein. And it's something that uh, a lot of people are talking about nowadays with people going on gluten-free diets and all that. So I found this nice little video. I'm going to play this for you. And, and it's going to talk about what gluten is and what the big deal is. And um, there is uh, a lot of opinions around gluten. This is an area where the science, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting when you do a deep dive into the science of gluten in terms of you know who is actually gluten intolerant. Probably a lot less people than you might think. Um, but I'm not going to judge anybody for going on a gluten-free diet. If they find it is helping with their health, then, then that's great. Right? Um, we, we don't want to be judging people. So I'll play this for you, and it talks about what the big deal is around gluten. Whether you eat it or not, you've likely heard of gluten. With the growing trend of gluten-free diets, it has a lot of people wondering, what the heck is it? More importantly, should you be eating it? Simply put, gluten is a combination of two proteins found primarily in wheat and related grains like barley and rye. That's it. It's just protein. These two proteins called gliadin and glutenin combine, creating gluten, which helps to nourish the plant's embryos and is a major component in giving the foods you eat that chewy goodness. It's kind of like glue. It makes dough stretchy and gives bread its sponge-like properties. So why is it so bad? Well, it's not. In fact, it's neither detrimental or essential for your health. And there's very little evidence to suggest that cutting it out is the healthier choice for the average person. On the other hand, those with a chronic digestive disorder called celiac disease aren't able to eat gluten at all, and this is where some confusion may have stemmed from. If consumed, a celiac's body sees gluten as an invader and triggers an immune response which ends up damaging the small intestine. Too much of this, and their body begins to suffer major nutritional deficiencies. More recently, scientists have recognized another small proportion of the population that aren't celiac but still have gluten sensitivity. That is, they suffer similar symptoms after eating gluten like cramps, diarrhea, and bloating. In both of these cases, gluten-free food options are essential. But if you don't suffer from either, there isn't much weight to the other health claims of gluten-free diet. Diets. It's in no way a toxin, as some may suggest, and gluten-free doesn't necessarily mean that food is more natural, healthier, or lower in calories. Conversely, there are some risks of cutting gluten out. While the lack of gluten itself is of no concern, the vitamins and whole grains that it's often combined with are quite important. Without supplementing them, you could be hurting your own health. On top of it all, without gluten to bind your food together, more fat and sugar are often used to make gluten-free foods more enjoyable. At the same time, the popularity and fad of gluten-free diets has created a market for these foods. Where there once was little selection, now there are gluten-free options all over the place, and that's pretty cool for those who actually need it. But what if there was a substance that only included the stuff your body needed and took out all the things that you don't? Like the perfect diet all in one. Come with us to our second channel, ASAP Thought, where we break down how in the future you may never. A couple other things we'll just say about gluten. Um, maybe we'll come back to it again a little bit later. There's a lot of misinformation about it, which they alluded to on this video. Uh, it was being a toxin or those kind of things. And uh, so just be aware of what you see if you're looking up gluten. 
Um, like I said, don't judge people on this. My uh, my sister-in-law was having some issues, digestive issues, and she tried the gluten-free diet, and so my brother-in-law did too, and they both claim they feel a lot better. Um, you know, it was talking about bloating and things like that. I think they had some some of those kind of issues. Uh, so it's not necessarily a bad thing, and if, uh, if you know, for them, they felt they were cutting out a lot of calories that they didn't need as well. So again, it's one of those things. I always thought like everyone's cutting up gluten, so maybe I should it should come in like a jar and I could sprinkle it on my food, right? Because we always got to cut out the, the good tasting stuff. <laughs> uh, that was always my thought about gluten, but thankfully I don't need to need to get rid of it. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about protein deficiency and surplus. Um, there are a, a number of diseases around protein deficiency. The, uh, the textbook goes on in a lot of detail about these things. Um, I'm not sure how to say this one. Oshikor, I don't know if I'm saying that right or not. Um, so these two uh, disorders here, Osh, Osh Yorkor, maybe? I'm sure there's somebody on, on YouTube that tells you how to say it. Marasmus. Um, both of these symptoms are um, associated with um, uh, protein deficiencies. Um, the marasmus is a bit more of a, of a starvation thing as opposed to proteins directly. And uh, you can sort of see there's some, you can sort of see the comparison of what is going on here. I think I've got a little chart here in the next slide. Yeah, there we go. That kind of talks about some of the symptoms in between. And, and these are the kind of uh, things that you see when, you know, you're looking at uh, videos that are talking about usually different parts of the world where people are in fact starving or they're malnourished and whatnot. And uh, so you can see some of the, the differences between the marasmus, like I said, is mostly a wasting disease. So you're looking at uh, very skinny tissues as you start to starve and not get enough carbohydrates, your body's gonna break down the proteins because it needs to make the glucose for the brain and those kind of things. Um, the uh, there's usually some edema that's, um, that's um, um, fluids under the skin. So you got bruising and things like that and swelling in different tissues and, and whatnot. I'm not gonna go into that in a lot of detail, um, but you can you can read about it if you want. If you want. Um, but obviously it, it's, a, it's a big deal for some people in different parts of the world. Not so much in Canada. In Canada, we tend to have a surplus of food for the most part, which is, which is very good for us. You can get protein excess. There's not a lot of research into this area. Um, usually people who are getting an excess of protein are getting an excess of everything else, right? So it's more of the calorie excess that they're, they're concerned about and those kind of things. And so all of those degenerative diseases that we've been talking a little bit about, uh, things like diabetes, um, other, uh, other things like hypertension, uh, often that is what's associated with it. But uh, you can see that the DRI is recommending no more than 35%. Um, and again, it's something that uh, we're, we're trying to understand. It's not something, like I said, usually when people are getting excess of proteins, it's more or less an excess of everything that is the concern, of course. But there are some risks. You can see obesity, heart disease, and large kidneys and bone loss. I'm not sure how all that, all that relates. Okay, so what I want to talk about was uh, a little bit about, oh, that question? Oh, there's a chat question. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay, so Keisha, you're saying she has uh, celiac and a gluten diet completely changed her life. She feels so much better. And she wasn't diagnosed until she was 10, and her body is definitely infected by some thing with the gluten. Yeah, yeah, there's lots of, uh, thanks for sharing, Keisha. There's lots of testimonies like that, right? And, uh, you know, thankfully now there's a lot more products available for, for people in, uh, that are going gluten free, of course. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, vegetarian and vegetarians and so on. It's one of those areas where it's kind of a, it's kind of a weird uh, thing to talk about because you're more or less talking about what you don't eat rather than what you do eat. And I'll have some definitions here I'll share with you in a minute. But here's some, here's some numbers. I found some stats. So apparently around 2.3 million Canadians uh, consider themselves vegetarian. So that's a little less than 10%. Um, and we're counting vegans as, as separate. So about 850,000 people. I'm trying to remember what the percentage was. I think it was around 8% of Canadians total is what I remember. Um, province uh, with the highest amount of vegetarians and vegans is British Columbia. Anyone surprised? No. <laughs> I'd actually lived in Vancouver for one year and I was just like, I was shocked how many people were vegetarians. It was just like, wow, what's going on? Something's in the water around here. Um, uh, some cultural things going on as well, right? Uh, share of Canadians willing to reduce meat consumption is 36.5%. So, so that's not bad. Um, 
that's the, and then you can see some some charts here. So where is uh, is Alberta in there? No, we have is Alberta considered the prairies? I guess. Yeah. So a little bit lower on that end, maybe because we have so many cows. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's where it gets confusing, like I said, with the terms, right? <clears throat> I have some very good friends and they, they're, they're vegetarian, right? And they seem to be eating everything that I eat, except for I found out there's one thing they don't eat. They don't eat red meat, right? So, okay, so you're a vegetarian, like seriously, you're eating a lot of meat. Um, but you can see that's on here somewhere where it's a partial vegetarian, right? But anyway, I guess it's something that, uh, their, their families, they have to continually remind their families because for their families, uh, a meal always consists of some red meat and potatoes, right? So it's kind of that, that's the families they're from. So they say they're vegetarian because to, to, to their families, you know, some people, you know, meat is poultry meat, right? Some people say, no, it's poultry, right? Uh, so it, it gets a little confusing around the terms and whatnot. Uh, for them, actually, this was because they were living in the UK and uh, I don't remember how many years ago this was now, but there was, um, uh, risks of uh, like mad cow disease and whatnot and so so beef was kind of like off the market unless you wanted to pay like premium prices so they stopped eating beef entirely and they felt that so they decided they would just go with this little experiment and try it for a few years and, and, and they're much happier after that um you can see some of the definitions here right vegan is usually the one that you might call a strict vegetarian usually there's no animal products whatsoever so no dairy products no eggs nothing like that um and then you've got everything in between, right? You can have some vegetarians that are vegan, except for they will eat eggs, or they're vegan, except for they will eat eggs and milk. Uh, and so there's lots of different definitions in between. So you can see like lacto ovo vegetarian. So you're defining what they do eat. They do eat dairy and eggs, um, but they're not eating any, any flat, right? So uh, lots of different definitions in there. Um, fruitarian, I don't know how that works out for you. You're just eating fruit. Uh, I don't know too much about it. I know that um, apparently, what's that guy's name? I can't think of his name. The, the Apple founder. I can't think of his name. Steve Jobs. Apparently, he was a fruitarian. And um, I don't know much behind that and how that went for him. Um, but apparently, because that guy was famous and so, you know, somewhat of a celebrity, lots of people try the fruitarian diet. And lots of people end up with all sorts of nutrient deficiencies. <laughs> Um, and so apparently can make you very sick. You can imagine you're excluding quite a few things from your diet, you're only eating fruit. Uh, so like I said, I don't know a lot about that one. I did find this nice little handy chart though, that kind of talks about the kind of the mainstream usual types of vegetarians that you might have. Uh, and uh, there's a little bit and everything in between. So let's talk a little bit about um, why, why do people want to be vegetarians? Just wanted to open that up for a minute. Is anyone here a vegetarian? Do you mind sharing? None? One? That's it? I'm so disappointed. That's okay. Why, why are you a vegetarian? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I actually have a friend that way. And, and when he, and once in a while, you know, he'd be on a meal and eats a little meat and then it just his stomach just can't take it, right? Yeah. When I was in high school, we had to drive test food at church and I didn't eat red meat for five years after that. Oh, wow. <laughs> and now I participate in hunting so many. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's, there's tons of reasons, right? Um, I had a student here a few years ago and she's from India and uh, her family was Hindu and of course they don't eat meat at all, except for when she became a university student, she decided she'd try it and uh, a, a weekend of binging on hamburgers <laughs> and regretted it later. Um, so I don't know what her deal is now, but she was telling me all about it and how she's like, I don't know about it. It was so good at home, my stomach hurt so much. And it was kind of an interesting story, but. I don't drink milk, <laughs> like I understand that mm -hmm. it's because of but yeah actually uh, milk is something that's been vilified for sure uh, i remember when i was a student um at university some guy was walking around in a milk carton costume you know with a big poison symbol on his chest and, and, and trying to hand out pamphlets and, and whatnot and didn't pay too much attention at the time, but the, 
the idea is that most mammals, when they wean, they don't drink milk ever again. And so this, this philosophy was, this is not natural. You shouldn't be as an adult mammal drinking milk, right? And then, or maybe it had something with the dairy industry as well. Of course, you know, with all of the uh, mass farming and whatnot, there's a lot of documentaries that will turn you off of meat <laughs> and any day, right? Uh, there was one I remember watching on, I don't know what it was called, um, but seriously, like five minutes into this thing, you're crying, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, and, and that's 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 another thing, right? Uh, lots of reasons, right? There's there's could be. Um, I had a friend who read uh, there's there's an old book called Diet for a Small Planet, right? Talking about uh, you know basically the environmentalism aspect of it in terms of you know we're trying to feed what are we at about seven and a half billion people now, and if you take a look at how much water and other resources go into uh, you know feeding and watering cows. Uh, you can do a lot better with agriculture if you're just doing plants. Um, there's, there's religious reasons um, and everything else in between, taste, right? Or I just saw a fetal pig and we had enough. <laughs> Another comment? Uh, there's a, a farmer from Idaho now. He mm -hmm. has like the funniest videos. He puts up on TikTok and Facebook. They're real. And he responds to a lot of the vilification of the farming business and mm -hmm. he explains how that and he does it like in a comedic manner, so he's pretty on board about showing how things are running yeah, the yeah. dairy industry now. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, it's it's. Uh, I think I think with farming and stuff, we're all most of us nowadays have had so minimal experience with that, right? If you've done hunting, then you understand what it's like to kill and slaughter an animal, right? And that's something that used to be a normal human experience for everybody. You know, now we're so far detached from it. I mean, if you buy a chicken in, like, let's say, I have a friend who lives in Morocco, and she's telling me how she had to learn how to, how to do this. You go to the chicken market, and it's there. And you say that one, and the guy chops the head off and gives it to you, feather and all. And so she had to learn how to deal with that, right? You know, now we get it. It's like, I buy chicken. It doesn't have bones in it. It's great, <laughs> right? It's so far removed from the actual animal. Uh, it's so easy for us to get, get attached to that. But I mean, that's the omnivore dilemma, right? Do we do we want to kill a other animals for this? And that's something I think, you know, there's there's a lot we could discuss with that. But it's it's very interesting. If you you know, I, I think everybody who is a vegetarian, I always ask them, oh, you know, tell me more about it. It's a very interesting conversation to come up because the reasons are are hugely varied. So I just put together a little table here. Advantages, right? We can compare vegetarian and omnivore. Um, there's lots of reasons why uh, people may choose being a vegetarian. Um, I know a number of people that have chosen for health. Uh, I had a student two years ago and she was telling me all about it. And um, she was talking about having, uh, she was she was on the basketball team and then she had stopped being a, an athlete and was gaining weight and was feeling uh, exhausted and whatnot and decided to give it a try and, and found that she was getting more energy and losing weight and all those kind of things, right? Uh, but, you know, all the good things, right? Lots of fiber, things we've been talking about, um, looking at getting, uh, you know, a, a better balance of uh, less saturated fats and more unsaturated fats, you know, all those kind of things puts you at risk or less risk for a number of uh, typical conditions such as diabetes and various cancers and things like that. We're going to talk about cancer uh, a little bit later on in the semester, by the way. Uh, other things, right, I mentioned, you know, things like taste, saving the animals, better things for the environment. Um, I did put a question mark there. Uh, because depending on how you talk about the environment, some things going with a vegan diet is better and some things are not. And I'll, I'll uh, maybe talk about that a little bit later on in the semester as well. Uh, omnivores, right? Convenience, uh, complete protein, um, concentrated source of nutrient. You know, you don't have to think so much, right? Uh, and and uh, all of those kind of things, right? I was talking to my nephew who went vegan a couple of years ago. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a lot more natural to him now, but uh, initially thinking about getting complete protein and getting all the nutrients he needed was a big deal. Um, taste satisfaction, uh, you know, I've, I've joked many times, I would be a, a vegan if chicken didn't taste so good, right? You know, it's, it's amazing. Chicken is just incredible. And then, you know, all the other things, right? You know, in the spring, the first time you crack out your barbecue and have a hamburger, you've gone all winter with having I mean, you know, come on, right? <laughs> um, but anyway, lots of lots of reasons back and forth. So, what about the science? 
Um, it is complicated, okay? And this is, again, one of these stories with nutrition science where we're talking about, uh, you know, you've got a thousand variables, right? We're defining people by what they don't eat, but we're not defining them by all of the other life choices that they make. So this is where it's complicated, right? So kind of here's the story, right? Generally, a lot of people who are vegetarians are health conscious as well. So they might be exercising, um, they're consuming less alcohol, uh, making other lifestyle choices that are gonna maybe make them healthier overall. So trying to you know, tease out what is better for that, that bigger picture is, is kind of difficult uh, in order to do. Um, and, and that's kind of a big part of the story. Um, and also, like I said, kind of grouping everyone together, it it's doesn't, doesn't even make sense, right? Uh, but in general, the research is kind of suggesting that it's a good idea. But the thing is, when we compare them to omnivores, um, not necessarily seeing a difference if you see somebody who's also following a lot of these lifestyle habits, people who exercise regularly, don't uh, smoke very, don't smoke, don't consume a lot of alcohol, those kind of things. It starts to shift towards people who are higher consumers of meat, and that's where you're starting to see those risk factors go up quite dramatically. And like I said, we'll talk about that with, when we get to cancer in terms of, uh, you know, red meat is a carcinogen, by the way. Um, but the question is, if you're eating moderate amounts, is it still carcinogenic? And probably not, right? It's carcinogenic, and we can see that for people who eat uh, large amounts of it. For people who have moderate amounts, the risk is, is not any higher than vegetarian. So just something else to kind of throw out there. Uh, okay, so if you are going vegan, some things to think about, okay? Um, there are some nutrients you may have a hard time finding, okay? And so these are the types of things that you want to take a look at, at and make sure you get. And I, I have a slide that's going to talk about each of these a little bit. And particularly, um, certain people are more vulnerable. Uh, children and pregnant women kind of being the, the top two. Uh, there is research done on vegan children. And they tend to, on average, be a little smaller and a little lighter than their omnivore counterparts. But they're still within a healthy range. So that's one thing, right? As long as it's done well and they're getting enough iron and things that they need to grow, uh, it, it can be done well. Uh, I do have a, a colleague here on campus, and him and his wife are vegan, and um, but they decided they would feed their child meat just to make sure he's getting enough protein and enough iron and those kind of things. Uh, so, you know, those are the decisions parents have to make. Uh, pregnant women, of course, you are um, growing another human inside. And same thing, uh, you're going to go through tons and tons of iron. You're going to go through tons and tons of protein. And so that's another area that's uh, at risk. And uh, often, um, if you are vegan and planning to get pregnant or are pregnant, you know, that's something that you want to um, think about carefully to make sure you're getting all, all those essential nutrients. Uh, so a little bit about um, uh, nutrients, uh, protein, it's the same, right? You're trying to get the same amount, whether you're vegan or non-vegan. Uh, most, most vegans and vegetarians in Canada get more than enough protein, um, not usually a big deal. Iron is one of the big ones, and uh, vegetarians often require more iron than people who eat meat. There's actually, um, uh, there's these, these chemicals called uh, uh, chelators, which bind metals, and they're typically more found in vegetables and which it means that the iron in vegetables is sometimes harder to uh, detach from these chelators uh, for digestion. So usually they recommend more iron for vegetarians to make sure you're actually getting enough that you're absorbing in the intestine. Um, zinc is another one. Um, it's usually found in meat and so and not as well absorbed from plant products. So another one as well. Calcium. Um, Again, right? Something that's usually found in milk and certain meat products, but there are lots of uh, lots of plant sources of calcium. I believe broccoli is a good one, uh, and sesame seeds. Uh, but I'd have to add the lecture a little bit. About. Uh, vitamin B12 again is another one, uh, and so sometimes you can get it from uh, soy products. And vitamin D. We're going to talk about vitamins very shortly here. Uh, vitamin D is from getting exposure to the sun and mostly meat products. So vegetarians are very uh, big risk of getting being short in vitamin D. And the omega fatty acids, again, you know, looking at that balanced diet and whatnot. So if you do plan on becoming a vegan, sometimes it's just worth it to kind of make sure you're getting a good balanced diet and, uh, and it, it can be done. 
Okay, so one more thing kind of talk about, what about these, um, I don't know what you want to call them, fake meat products that I'm popping out, right? So there's like Beyond Beef or Beyond Burger or whatever it's called. I saw that in um, the grocery store the other day. Uh, KFC is coming out with vegan chicken nuggets. Yeah, I was reading a review of them and apparently you can't tell the difference. They taste exactly like the real chicken ones, right? So that's amazing, right? You know, we can we can eat these things and we can be healthier, right? Probably not. Um, if you take a look at this whole thing, um, in many cases, you're getting the same amount of saturated fat and calories. Sometimes you're getting more sugar or salt or something in there. Sometimes they're trying to, they're putting in all that extra stuff to make it taste good. And if you compare the nutrients, it's not really that much different. You're probably not eating healthier. If you're eating all these greasy burgers, you're eating a greasy vegan burger versus eating a greasy normal hamburger, you're still getting a lot of grease and a lot of saturated fats. It's just the source. So they may be better than for the environment. Um, they're certainly not cheaper uh, at the moment. Maybe someday they will be. Um, you know, you can't have it all, unfortunately, right? This is one of these stories of where something may be too good to be true, it probably is. Now, some of these you can see on this end, they seem to be lower calorie. And uh, I don't know about this Morning Star black bean product. I do remember having a black bean burger once and that was enough for a lifetime. It just tasted terrible. Um, so, right, you know, I want something that tastes good. Quite honestly, I want fat and salt and sugar if I want something that tastes good, right? If it doesn't have any of those things, it's a vegetable. And, um, right, and some, yeah, okay, you're right. Some vegetables are great. I love cucumbers and broccoli. But, um, yeah, but usually if I want things that taste good, fat is the key, right? <laughs> I've heard about that, yeah. I hear they're good, yeah. And um, the bagels that they're like doing all this steak, mm -hmm. it's like a cauliflower steak. I know that it's definitely not the same thing, but that place huh. is pretty good. Okay, yeah, maybe I'll check that out if I go there. Uh, okay, so that's it for the protein unit. I think about half of you have done the quiz already. Um, so it'll be due next week if you haven't done it. And um, that's it for proteins, okay? So we'll come back to some of these concepts. Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm hoping to talk about, uh, little, we're gonna talk a little bit more about cancer and things like that a little bit later on in the semester. And um, that's something that's a huge interest, I think, to everybody. And, uh, um, and if you're not gonna have it in your lifetime, you'll certainly know somebody who will have uh, some sort of cancer. Okay, so time check. Okay, so let's talk about vitamins. Um, lots to say about vitamins. Uh, there's some of them I'm going to go into in a lot of detail, and some of them we're going to whiz through like crazy. All right, so just warning you on that one. Uh, vitamin D in particular, I've done quite a bit of research on vitamin D. For one of my other classes, we had an entire you know, a week we had spent on vitamin D. So I apologize if I go a little bit overboard on it. I find vitamin D really fascinating and I find the whole human story around vitamin D very interesting because uh, it seems a lot of people have really strong opinions on vitamin D, especially lately on Facebook. Everyone thinks if you just have enough vitamin D, you'll never get COVID or something like that, which is just <coughs> garbage, absolute garbage. Um, what's that? Zinc to go for another reason. Of course. Actually, there is a little bit of um, science behind zinc in that uh, it will actually prevent um, a rhinovirus binding in the nose, apparently. But nobody's putting zinc in the nose, right? That's the problem with that, right? That's the, that's the problem with the logic on that, right? Um, so they think if they suck on a zinc tablet, it won't attach to the back of their throat, which is true. But the rhinovirus and the coronavirus will usually actually go through your nose, right? So that's the problem. Anyway, usually that's, that's the thing with a lot of these science stories. There's a little bit of truth to it, and somebody just takes it and they run with it, and then it goes all over the place, right? Yeah. But anyway, that's enough of my rant for now. So, question? I think I put it on. Did I put it up there? I thought I did yesterday. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. First of all, let's talk about what a vitamin is. Okay, it's not those other things we talked about, right? It's not a carbohydrate, it's not a fat, it's not a protein, it's not a macronutrient, meaning it's not, these aren't large molecules and we're not getting energy from them. Uh, but they are organic molecules. By organic, I mean they have, they're made out of carbon and hydrogen and other elements uh, and they are essential. 
there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk about some of them. And, um, you know, one of the questions I always had, and you can, you can Google this, is, uh, you know, why they're named the way they are. And then every, every vitamin has a different historical reason why it's named, why, what it is. Vitamin A was the first one found. So that's a good place to start. But after that, it gets complicated because, of course, there's different languages uh, and people have, you know, some of the vitamins are named after their source, like uh, vitamin K, I think, is from a German word and, and things like that. And it, it gets kind of complicated and weird. But we're going to talk about some of them here. So I have a nice little video to share with you that's kind of a good introduction to vitamins. And uh, I'll play that for you. And uh, then we'll start talking about that some of A, C, E, D, B, K. No, this isn't some random out-of-order alphabet. These are vitamins. And just like letters build words, they're the building blocks that keep the body running. Vitamins are organic compounds we need to ingest in small amounts to keep functioning. They're the body's builders, defenders, and maintenance workers, helping it to build muscle and bone, make use of nutrients, capture and use energy, and heal wounds. If you need convincing about vitamin value, just consider the plight of olden days sailors who had no access to vitamin-rich fresh produce. They got scurvy. But vitamin C, abundant in fruits and vegetables, was the simple antidote to this disease. While bacteria, fungi, and plants produce their own vitamins, our bodies can't, so we have to get them from other sources. So how does the body get vitamins from out there into here? That's dependent on the form these compounds take. Vitamins come in two types, lipid-soluble and water-soluble and the difference between them determines how the body transports and stores vitamins and gets rid of the excess. The water solubles are vitamin C and B complex vitamins that are made up of eight different types that each do something unique. These are dissolved in the watery parts of fruits, vegetables, and grains, meaning their passage through the body is relatively straightforward. Once inside the system, these foods are digested and the vitamins within them are taken up directly by the bloodstream. Because blood plasma is water-based, water-soluble vitamins C and B have their transport cut out for them and can move around freely within the body. For lipid-soluble vitamins, dissolved in fat and found in foods like dairy, butter, and oils, this trip into the blood is a little more adventurous. These vitamins make it through the stomach and the intestine, where an acidic substance called bile flows in from the liver, breaking up the fat and preparing it for absorption through the intestinal wall. Because fat-soluble vitamins can't make use of the blood's watery nature, they need something else to move them around. And that comes from proteins that attach to the vitamins and act like couriers, transporting fat solubles into the blood and around the body. So this difference between water or fat-soluble vitamins determines how they get into the blood, but also how they're stored or rejected from the body. The system's ability to circulate water-soluble vitamins in the bloodstream so easily means that most of them can be passed out equally easily via the kidneys. Because of that, most water-soluble vitamins need to be replenished on a daily basis through the food we eat. But fat-soluble vitamins have staying power because they can be packed into the liver and in fat cells. The body treats these parts like a pantry, storing the vitamins there and rationing them out when needed, meaning we shouldn't overload on this type of vitamin because the body is generally well-stocked. Once we've figured the logistics of transport and storage, the vitamins are left to do the work they came here to do in the first place. Some, like many of the B-complex vitamins, make up coenzymes, whose job it is to help enzymes release the energy from food. Other B vitamins then help the body to use that energy. From vitamin C, you get the ability to fight infection and make collagen, a kind of tissue that forms bones and teeth and heals wounds. Vitamin A helps make white blood cells, key in the body's defense, helps shape bones, and improves vision by keeping the cells of the eye in check. Vitamin D gathers calcium and phosphorus so we can make bones, and vitamin E works as an antioxidant, getting rid of elements in the body that can damage cells. Finally, from vitamin K, we score the ability to clot blood, since it helps make the proteins that do this job. 
Without this vitamin variety, humans face deficiencies that cause a range of problems, like fatigue, nerve damage, heart disorders, or diseases like rickets and scurvy. On the other hand, too much of any vitamin can cause toxicity in the body, so there goes the myth that loading yourself with supplements is a great idea. In reality, it's all about getting the balance right and hitting that vitamin jackpot. Okay, so that was kind of a nice little introduction to vitamin D. It's kind of sometimes hard to explain what they're doing um, without some advanced biochemistry, but you kind of think of them as essential components of a lot of your proteins, right? So if you think about something like hemoglobin, hemoglobin is a protein that carries oxygen in your body, right? You probably know that hemoglobin has iron in it, that's the red part, but it kind of needs an adapter because you probably also know that iron, when it combines with oxygen, it forms into rust, right? So what you need is an adapter so that the oxygen will bind iron kind of loosely as, so it can be released and not just form rust. So that's what the vitamin is doing in, in hemoglobin. And, and so it's, it's kind of like having, a, a, you know, you have a car, you got a steering wheel, and you need something to connect the steering wheel to the, the you know, axle. Um, it's, they're essential components for a lot of proteins. So this is why they're involved in many, many parts of the body. Um, he talked about the two different types. So the fat soluble, and the, uh, uh, the water-soluble vitamins. And uh, the differences are partly the solubility, but it actually has differences in terms of what your body does with them and can store them. The fat-soluble ones, we can store and we can bank them. So you can eat a whole bunch of vitamin A and you can store it in your fat tissue, and, uh, and then you don't need any vitamin A tomorrow. Um, and he's saying, of course, uh, the issue is you can, of course, build these things up and have uh, toxic amounts if you have too much of them. Whereas the water-soluble vitamins, um, they absorb very easily. Um, they're in water, and uh, but you're not going to store very much of them in your body, if any at all. So it's more important for them that you are consuming them on a daily basis. Um, you can see the fat-soluble vitamins. I was trying to find a way to remember which was which. I was scouring the internet for some memory methods to remember which vitamins were which. I I don't have a good one for you, except for this one here. All dietitians eat kale. So that was the only one I could, I could think of. Um, and the, uh, you can see they all have alternate names as well. That's where it gets confusing. So in the bold, I have the, the most commonly used names for these things. And in the brackets are their other names. So you can see, for example, the B vitamins. Some of them, we call them vitamin B12. For example, we call vitamin B12. It has an actual name, which is cyano. Thalaminum, I guess. I'm not sure how to say that one either. Um, whereas B3, we just call it nice and so on. So I'll just use the most common names for these. And um, uh, uh, but you can, you know, once in a while you might hear the, the other names pop out in there. So let's talk about the fat soluble vitamins. We'll probably get through through those today, uh, and we'll probably uh, do the, the water soluble next day. Uh, why is this not mixing? Okay, so let's talk about vitamin A for a few minutes here. Um, so vitamin A, like I said, was the first vitamin actually to be discovered, and um, it's also called uh, called retinol. And uh, you can see there's some of the sources that you might find it in. So quite a variety of, of uh, food products. And uh, vitamin A uh, is famous for having something to do with vision. So you may notice on this slide here, there's carrots. They have it in orange. And everyone seems to know there's something to do with carrots and vitamin A. Okay, uh, and so that's something I want to talk about right, right away is that, okay, first of all, carrots don't have vitamin A. They have something called beta carotene. Uh, but beta carotene can be taken in your body and turned into vitamin A. So I wrote this on the board because one thing I was going to mention is that a lot of vitamins we eat, we can either eat them in the vitamin form or we can eat them in, we would call it a precursor form or a provitamin form. And that means that it's a different molecule, but your body can take it and modify it make it into the actual vitamin. So that's what's in carrots, something called beta carotene. And it's orange, it's a pigment, and that's what makes the carrot orange. So we'll come back to that in a few minutes. Uh, but vitamin A has a role in a bunch of areas. Um, besides vision, um, a lot of these fat-soluble vitamins also have roles in, uh, in bone growth and the immune system function. You're going to see that's kind of a common theme 
with the fat soluble vitamin bones immune system uh, and then a variety of other things depending on the actual actual vitamin um, vitamin a is very strongly um, uh, uh, correlated with with healthy vision uh, and uh, has anyone ever heard somebody say eat those carrots and you'll see better okay i'm going to talk about that in a minute uh, most of us that's not going to happen uh, most of us have more than enough vitamin A to have healthy eyes. Uh, vitamin A is known as retinol, and uh, that's actually for um, it's actually a vitamin that's used to build up uh, part of the cornea lens of your um, of your eyeball. So you have enough of it, you will have a healthy eye. If you don't have enough of it, your cornea kind of um, I can't remember what the process is called. Uh, keratinization is the process what it's called. And uh, what that means is you have little cells that kind of wither up and they dry and this thing can get cloudy. And uh, if you don't get vitamin A right away, eventually that will lead to loss of vision or blindness. And uh, that's maybe one of the number one uh, ways worldwide we can prevent blindness is just making sure people have enough nutrition. So there is some truth to that seeing and eating carrots bit and that carrots can give you that, that vitamin, but we're not gonna see better. Okay, and I'll, I'll show you why that is here in a moment. A um, bunch of other functions. You can see it's talking about maintenance of skin and epithelium. Um, vitamin A is involved in cell differentiation. So your cells, they divide and they turn into skin cells or bone cells or whatever. And so it's, it's involved in that process. And if you don't have it, uh, your skin can get a little more brittle. You can bruise a little easier, those kind of things. Uh, what else is on there? Supports the immune system. This is one of these vitamins that has been, I've noticed, you know, with the advertising, um, you know, that says has vitamin A to boost your immune system, okay? And um, that's another thing I have a problem with, and we'll talk about this um, next lecture about immune system boosting, because that, why that is a massive myth again, okay? Um, we, we don't want to boost our immune system. Let me just say that. If you boost your immune system, you're going to end up with a bunch of autoimmune diseases, okay? Uh, you want to have a healthy immune system, yes, and vitamin A has some connections there. Uh, what else was I going to say about this? Yeah. Uh, yeah, if you don't get enough vitamin A, you're going to look at having weaker bones and those kind of things as well. Uh, but the big one is vision. So I do want to show you a little uh, video I found. I was going to talk about it myself, but I found this nice short video that talks about why you're not going to see better if you just eat a whole bunch of carrots. On a side note, I was reading a story book to my son, and uh, the claim in the book is if you eat a thousand carrots, you'll turn invisible. I don't think that's true either, but I haven't put it to the test. So let me play this for you. You heard it over and over again from your mom. Eat your carrots, they'll help you see better. Well, get ready to throw it back in mom's face with science. Actually, before we get to the science, let's have a history lesson. During World War II, British pilots had this fancy new top secret system for spotting enemy planes called radar. And no, not that radar. Look it up, kids. Our chemist friend Chad Jones picks up the story from here. This fancy new radar system gave pilots a huge advantage over their enemy. To keep the advantage a secret, the British Royal Air Force started a rumor that their pilots ate lots of carrots to help them see the enemy better at night. Of course it wasn't the carrots, it was just the radar, but the rumor actually stuck, and it still circulates to this day. And the funny thing is, there's actually a bit of truth to it. Carrots have in them a chemical compound called beta-carotene, and no, it's not named after carrots. When you eat foods with beta-carotene, your body converts it into vitamin A, and that vitamin A gets turned into retinol. Now retinol is found in your eyes inside vision cells called rods. At the very tip of the cell, you'll find retinol, wrapped inside of a protein. That protein is twisted and compact, a little bit like this ball of yarn. And retinol sits comfortably inside, like a baby wrapped in a tight blanket. But when light shines on this happy sleeping baby, it stretches out from this form, called cis, to this form, called trans. The stretching unravels the protein, starting a chain reaction that leads down the rod cell, through the nerves, and to the brain letting you know it's not dark anymore. And that's how you see light. So where does that leave our carrot myth? Well, any food that has vitamin A will be good for your overall eye health. That's carrots, lettuce, spinach, mangoes, milk, cheese, cantaloupe, and peas. But if you already have a diet with plenty of vitamin A, these foods won't actually improve your vision. 
so don't forget your vitamin A, but don't count on getting rid of your glasses anytime soon just because you're chopping out a carrot. Well, we want to give a big thank you. So there is also some connection, by the way, with vitamin A deficiency and uh, night blindness, right? So most of us are not in that point where we're going to end up getting blind entirely or whatever in terms of our, our, our nutrition. Um, but some people are deficient, and this is one of the better sort of understood um, uh, areas of uh, vitamin A deficiency is night blindness. You can see they're trying to show you here on the left-hand side, uh, you know, if you're driving and somebody has their lights in your eyes and your eyes, you know, they take a second or two to adjust. Adjust Someone with night blindness, their eyes do not adjust that quickly, right? And, and that's kind of what it is. And that's something too, as, as you get older, by the way, night blindness gets more and more difficult because you're, uh, and that has little to do with vitamin A and just more has to do with your eyeball. Uh, as your as your eyeball gets older, by the way, it it gets it gets more crystallized. It's not as gooey, and so it's harder for your muscles to kind of change the shape and focus on things. So that's why you know the older you get, the more you're squinting. You know you're trying really hard to change those eye shapes and those kind of things. And that's kind of what's going on as as, as you age. And that is not vitamin A uh, reliant, but immune deficiencies, right? Um, people with vitamin A deficiencies tend to get more certain types of cancers and things like that. And, and these are all sort of correlational studies in that we think this is the, we think this is the connection. And uh, we can show in cell culture that uh, uh, certain immune cells have vitamin A receptors. And so this is where the immune connection comes in on it. But for the most part, the biggest connection is, is blindness and night blindness. Um, this is kind of showing some of the effects of deficiency and toxicities. Uh, toxicity for vitamin A is, is not that common, um, especially if you're getting it from food sources, because most food sources are the beta carotene, and I'll talk about that in a moment. And as far as we know, you can't get toxic levels of beta carotene, but you can get toxic levels of pure vitamin A. And this is from uh, mostly, we know this from people taking supplements that are overdoing it. Uh, and you can see some of the things that are coming up, there's that skin relation, right? Uh, skin rashes, hair loss, sounds like fun, uh, hemorrhages, bone abnormalities, uh, birth defects, and arch fractures, and we've got a lot, a lot of terrible stuff. These, did all these lists end up with death, right? That's, I would notice that. And then you can see the deficiencies of some things that we talked about there, impaired immunity. And um, uh, I know that, uh, and I, I'm not exactly sure the connection, but um, um, there are uh, connections with birth defects, and uh, vitamin A is essential for. Uh, it's essential that pregnant women have uh, adequate amounts of vitamin A. Usually in Canada, though, it's not a big deal. Very few people in Canada are vitamin A deficient if you have a balanced diet. Often you're looking at people that uh, don't have balanced diets um, are uh, sometimes people like alcoholics or, um, or drug addicts who uh, can't afford food, so they're just eating Mr. Noodles. Uh, there's lots of cases like that in Canada, and this is where we see people, and they're not just deficient in one thing, they're deficient in everything. Question? Uh, I, I think I figured it out, but I was just going to ask like, the beta carotene comes from all of like your plant sources. The plant based uh, vitamin A's, yeah, sources. And I'll show you actually, uh, I think I've got a thing here uh, coming up uh, in a second. Uh, there's a map, by the way, vitamin A deficiency worldwide. Again, it's probably no surprise. There's just certain countries that are not as well off as, as we are, unfortunately. And you see, like a lot of these places, I was reading. Um, I don't remember which country it was talking about in sub-Saharan Africa. It was talking about vitamin A deficiencies, and uh, and there were the, these these kids were vitamin A deficient, and they were living literally living on a mango farm, right? So why are they vitamin A deficient? Because the parents would not allow the children to eat the produce because the produce was worth money, right? And so they were eating rice, basically is what they were living off of, and not giving the children any mango. So that so that. The story was about trying to educate people to say, look, you can't deprive your children of everything. You gotta, you gotta give them a balanced diet as well. We know rice is cheap and these mangoes are valuable, but just give them once, you know, give them mango once in a while, kind of thing. Uh, it's kind of interesting in a way. Um, so some sources of vitamin A, right? You can see kind of here up at the top, um, you've got some foods. Um, some of those brightly colored foods, so carrots and tomatoes, are famous for having beta carotene, certain types of red peppers. Um, shrimp, the pink shrimp, have, uh, have beta carotene in them as well. 
Uh, you can also see some milk products and some soy products and whatnot. And usually at the bottom of these, these charts that they have from the textbook, it's talking about unusual sources that are good for having it. And what's this red bar here? Oh, liver. Liver seems to have every vitamin in it and whatnot. And this is kind of the one food that someone might eat too much of and end up with a vitamin A toxicity. Uh, whoever you are, I don't recommend you eat a lot of liver all the time, no matter what. Uh, liver in animals can concentrate all sorts of things like heavy metals and other toxins. So it's, it's a very good source of a lot of things, but overeating it is risking uh, uh, some toxicity from uh, all sorts of things besides vitamin A. Uh, so this is saying, what is vitamin A and what is beta carotene? As I mentioned, beta carotene is a pigment found in plants that our body can take and turn into vitamin A. And it's orange. So has anyone ever heard that rumor that if you eat too many carrots, you'll turn orange? It's true. It is true. Um, I have a picture here. I was looking for a picture of somebody's face, but you know, it was mostly kids and stuff. I didn't want to show a bunch of kids on here, but you can, it can happen. Um, I used to live with a guy in university. I lived with him for a semester. And it happened to him, apparently. He was telling me about it. He would go to classes and have the baby carrots in his pocket and just munch on them all day long. And one day he looked in the mirror and he's like, I don't look so good. What's wrong with me? And I went to the doctor and the doctor knew instantly. He said, do you eat a lot of carrots? He's like, yes. And that was it. You know, Because initially it just looks like sort of a weird tan. And then uh, eventually it just got to a point where it's like, no, I'm orange. And it happens. Um, did you have a question or comment? My mom turned me orange. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It happens. It just it's it's a it's a fat soluble um, compound, uh, and will store it in the fat tissue under our skin. Right, that's what happens. Um, there's beta, uh, not beta carotene, but a different carotene in shrimp, and um, and uh, so if you eat too much shrimp, that kind of thing happens. Or if you're a flamingo, if you stop eating shrimp, you turn white. Right, you lose that color. That's actually where flamingos get their color from, from eating eating a certain type of shrimp. And uh, anyway, same idea, right? Other than turning orange, is there any like? As far as they know, there's no toxicity to this because it's not yet converted into vitamin A, right? It's just, yeah. So I don't know. Every once in a while, you see certain celebrities that look kind of orangish, and you wonder is is this what's going on, or just a bad spray tan? I don't know. <laughs> Okay, how are we doing for time? We're good. Lots of time to talk about vitamin D. Let's talk about vitamin D, okay? Um, tons and tons of myths on vitamin D. We'll get into that a little bit. But what do we know about vitamin D? Vitamin D is essential for your bones, okay? We know this 100% for sure. Uh, there's lots of cases uh, in, the, in the past where uh, people have bone uh, deficiencies, and I'll show you what that looks like in a second. And uh, I know I have some pictures here. And a bone deficiency in children is called rickets, or a vitamin D deficiency in children, right? And so what you have is your bone is not getting calcified the way it should. And so your bone is softer, and then as you grow, you're putting weight on your bones, and rather than your bones being nice and straight, they start to, you know, they start to bow out a little bit, and, uh, and you get these malformations here. And this is something that has been known of, rickets has been known of for centuries, and it was maybe about 100 years ago where we figured out what was going on. And, um, and then, well, once we figured out there was a vitamin related to it, we could do something about it. And uh, I'll talk about what we did here in a minute. Um, but a couple of things about, um, about vitamin D is there's lots of recommendations around babies and people in climates like Canada. And I'll talk about that in a minute as well. Um, if you're older, you may not necessarily get rickets, but you might get osteomalacia. Uh, which is different from osteoporosis, by the way, okay? Um, we'll talk about osteoporosis a little bit later on in the semester. Uh, and this is the same idea where your bones are getting decalcified. So vitamin D is essential for basically grabbing calcium and helping you put it in your bones. So we know that 100% for sure. Uh, and there's lots of good studies around it. There's vitamin D receptors in your immune cells and other tissues in your body. And uh, so there's probably a relationship with, with, uh, with your immune system and whatnot, but we don't really fully understand uh, what that relationship exactly is, uh, despite what people say on Facebook. <laughs> okay, uh, there's tons and tons and tons of claims about vitamin D, and it's really overwhelming. 
uh, if you do a deep dive on it. We'll get to that in a moment as well. Uh, so who's the risk group for this? Uh, women with low calcium intakes, uh, limited sun exposure. Like I said, I'll talk about the sun in a minute. That's one way we can get vitamin D. Um, multiple pregnancies, right? Uh, so sorry, women, you know, if you get pregnant, um, that fetus takes a lot out of you. <laughs> it's going to suck out calcium out of your bones because that baby wants bones. It's going to suck out iron from your blood because that baby wants iron and so on. So you got to make sure you have lots of those things in your diet so that you don't suffer. So particularly women who have several pregnancies in a row, in a row um, you know, that's a higher risk group of, of this thing kind of happening. You can see it's showing um, the bones getting a little weaker. Also, um, older women as well. Uh, once you hit menopause uh, and you have less estrogen in the system, um, the bones can get softer. So it's important to have vitamin D in there to make sure that they're nice and, nice and hard. Vitamin D, all about bones, okay? Definitely 100%. Everything else is kind of like we're working on, right? There's a lot of suggestions in, in the research about vitamin D may contribute to this. And like I said, there seems to be vitamin D receptors in multiple parts of our body, uh, particularly the immune system. Um, and so it, it might have something to do with these things. Okay, it might. Here's my warning, right? None of these are conclusive. All of these are these correlation things, but they're not necessarily more vitamin D causes this or less vitamin D causes this. Uh, and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Okay, because uh, there's tons and tons of misinformation about this. Uh, search vitamin D on the internet. You have graphics like this and claims like this all the time. This one here, it's saying that, okay, we definitely know all about rickets, but uh, all of these problems are because of vitamin D deficiencies, right? Okay, you can talk to multiple sclerosis researchers. We don't know the cause. We don't know the cause of multiple sclerosis. Okay, we don't. We have some ideas, there's some correlations, but this is something we actually don't really understand. We just know it happens more in countries like Canada that are further away from the, from the border. So maybe that has something to do with sunlight. Maybe it doesn't. Again, it's a correlation. All of these things are all over the internet like crazy. Okay. Um, and I was reading, this is actually a very good article. I'll refer, I'll refer you to this. He talks about this, about this a lot. Uh, and all the things that are going on, you hear stories like this all the time, right? So this is looking at people in Maine. And it was a very large sample, so 800,000 people. And they found that people are getting tested for vitamin D deficiencies all the time now. This is increasing like crazy. And, uh, and, and all these people, a lot of these people are being told that they're deficient and they're not, right? So this is kind of the big mystery that I ended up diving into in one of my other classes in terms of uh, you know, what's going on with this. And it's, it's not stopping, right? We've got tons and tons of people that are popping these vitamin D supplements um, which is not a bad idea in the, in the winter time in Canada, but some people, the dosage, they're, they're, they're like, it's crazy, right? Uh, so the uh, recommended dosage for most of us as adults is about 600 units. There are people taking 6,000, 8,000 units a day. Now that's a problem, right? Why are they doing this? Um, and that's a much bigger story uh, in terms of what is going on. Uh, just saying, beware. <clears throat> Scientific literature. I just did a quick search for vitamin D deficiency in the, in the scientific database, and these things popped up all over, right? You can see um, some people are bought into it, that it's an epidemic. Um, most serious researchers are saying, no, there's a debate, right, uh, in terms of what is going on here. Uh, and, um, you know, is this real kind of thing? So it's kind of an interesting thing to get into. I'll show you some recent studies that I, I popped. I was able to pull out, and you can see that, for example, this one here, 5,000 participants, um, they couldn't find any connection with heart attack prevention, right? And you can see this kind of story again and again with a lot of these claims, right, in terms of the connection. Um, Postmenopausal women uh, were randomly assigned to take vitamin D and calcium, and it didn't seem to protect them against cancer. So it's really hard for a lot of these ailments to get good data, right? Like think about something like cancer, okay? So cancer is about like 300 different diseases for starters, right? Um, cancer uh, has, in many cases, multiple causes, including genetic and environmental causes. It's really hard to tease out the details. So even looking at 2,000 participants um, is probably not enough. You, you need to look at the data of millions of people over a 40-year time period. That's really what the kind of research we need to do. Who's going to do it? 
There is one big study that was just concluded recently where they're looking at, uh, um, okay, there it says right there, 25,000 people, right? And in this case here, they wanted to look at um, a few different things. So they're looking at uh, uh, vitamin D and then uh, those omega fatty acids. So they're giving people fish oil, right? So they had four groups. And uh, this was a massively, uh, a massive study. Uh, so four groups, one got vitamin D and fish oil, one got uh, vitamin D only, the other got uh, fish oil only, and, and then the last was a control group um, that got nothing, right? So here's what they found in the group of uh, 25,000 people, is that uh, they had a number of cancer cases. And so the placebo group, that means the group that didn't get the vitamin D, had a few more cases. Um, they decided it was not really statistically significant, except for one population, which was for African Americans. So there might be a connection there again, because African Americans tend to have a lot darker skin, right? And, and dark skin uh, absorbs the sun in a different way than lighter skin. We'll talk about that in a minute. So there might be a connection. There might. Be. That's kind of what they're at, right? After this massive study, they've decided there might be a connection. <laughs> not very strong uh, sign of blame. Language. Cancer deaths, they did see a little bit of a connection, right? Um, so a bit of a decrease. Again, um, when you're only looking at a few hundred cases, how strong is the data? Uh, heart attacks, not too much of a difference, a small difference, side effects, uh, not really much of a difference either, right? So anyway, you can take a look at this, go to this uh, website, it's got lots of interesting data there. It's kind of one of those things you can spend a few hours on just kind of reading all the findings. It's really, really fascinating stuff. Uh, did you have your head up? Uh, yeah, the cancer death, wouldn't that just be easier to see if you're constantly testing people for cancer? Say again? Like, well, the cancer deaths, that one, I don't see the relevance because you're constantly testing those that group of people for cancers. So yeah. you're catching it really early. Well, and that's, yeah, and that's the other thing too, right? Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure all the details in terms of what they were doing with this, whether it was they... They gave people the supplements for five years and then just asked them questions at the end or whether they're checking in every three months, I'm not sure. Yeah, without, without looking at all the details on that. But um, this is what we need, really. We need these big studies to try to understand these things, you know, particularly to try to defend against false claims, whether people should be taking 6,000 units or not, right? Because I see that claim constantly uh, on the internet where people are saying you're vitamin D deficient, everybody in Canada, every single person is vitamin D deficient, you should be taking five of these pills a day, right? And that's that's where there's a problem. Uh, did you have a question? So the fact that kind of recent, there was a kind of recent reduction in African yeah. Americans who do not wear, uh, live near the equator. Right? Um, I think this was in the US. Okay, but I was in the US. So yeah. wouldn't it be reasonable to say that it's uh, living closer to the equator, you might have a higher reduction? Well, see, that's a, a good question. But the problem is, right, if you do, um, say you did this study in Alberta or California, and then you bring the same study and you bring it to Costa Rica, right? Now you've got an entirely different population with different diets, um, different environmental exposures, and those kind of things. And it just gets super complicated, right? Never mind. Um, you know, I, I don't know too much about what people in Costa Rica eat, but let's say they have a high fish diet. So that could actually be contributing to higher or lower cancer rates. So it gets very complicated, right? And this is why I said, like, we need to have these big studies to really start to tease up the details. Um, you know, what is going on here? Um, there's also cultural differences in some, in some ways, right? In terms of, uh, um, you know, if you look at your typical white guy in the United States and your typical black guy, right, um, there can be cultural differences that can contribute to that as well, right, um, particularly if you look in the states in terms of uh, housing and, and um, schooling and those kind of things, there's a lot more of a division in terms of, uh, you know, white people are typically living in suburbs, um, black children are typically more inner city, right, and so there's all sorts of things like that that can be contributing to the differences, and um, it, it's great that they've done this, but I feel like these big studies are just a start, really, in the long term of understanding vitamin D. Uh, I'll talk about skin color here in a minute um, when we get to the sun. But like I said, these these are, are good studies to have. And uh, they're also looking at the omega-3s. And you can see some of the information there also seems to be helping with heart health. 
Um, but that's not new information. We actually knew that the United States are good for our, our health. Uh, uh, that was that was not new information already. Um, like I said, multiple sclerosis is one of these things that we think about a lot in Canada. Uh, northern countries or countries away from the equator, uh, there's more likely chance of people coming down with multiple sclerosis. Uh, so what is going on? Generally, we have better nutrition in developing countries, things like that. So a lot of people think it has something to do with vitamin D deficiencies. Again, we're not sure, um, but there might be a connection there. Uh, multiple sclerosis is really interesting for a lot of reasons. It's also associated with, uh, with certain viral infections. Um, so the, the virus that gives you uh, infectious mononucleosis, uh, mono, that virus is, now, is known to be connected with multiple sclerosis as well. So probably something to do with, um, again, the immune system, right? So it all comes around. The immune system has something to do with vitamin D. And so there's all these, all these web of connections that we're trying to understand. Uh, too much vitamin D, right? So what was vitamin D doing? It's grabbing calcium and adding it to your bones. So if you have too much vitamin D, it can take calcium and start putting it in other tissues. And this is a bad thing. So you can see here's an example of one I found in the news, a man who was taking way too much for two and a half years, and his, he had ear, um, his, his kidneys were permanently damaged with too much calcification there. Uh, so this is kind of the one vitamin that we, we see in terms of toxic effects more often than probably any of the other ones. Uh, okay, yeah, so this is just kind of what I said, right? Vitamin D is stored in fat cells. Uh, you can get extra calcium being stored in different tissues, and this can be a problem. Again, the internet. <laughs> I found this one here. I don't know who this guy is, whether he is a vitamin D researcher or not, but anyone can make an infographic and post it on the, on the, on the internet, right? Um, and these things kind of just drive me nuts when I see these. So let's talk about the sun. Okay, um, this is a way for us to get vitamin D. So it turns out that uh, our sun, the sun has energy in it. You probably know that it's ultraviolet light. An ultraviolet light can interact with chemical bonds. You get too much of it, that can lead to skin cancer and, and excessive wrinkling and things like that. Um, but to get the right amount, it's going into your tissues. And actually we're taking um, uh, uh, basically cholesterol and it gets converted to this other chemical here that get, it gets converted to something called pre-vitamin D3. And then when the sun hits it, it gets converted to something else that goes to the liver and ultimately eventually it gets converted to vitamin D. So kind of cool, right? Uh, we can do this. We don't need to eat to get vitamin D, but here's the problem. In the winter, how much sunlight are you actually getting, right? You know, you're bundled up to right about here. Maybe your eyes are sticking out and then that's it. And then how much are you out? Like the last few months, how am I often have you guys been outside? Way too cold, quite honestly. Um, I found this. Um, I found this thing on the internet. Uh, I don't know how accurate it is, but you can punch in a whole bunch of different parameters in terms of uh, your sun exposure and whatnot. So I took March first, and I figured middle of the summer, July first, right? And so you can see some of the parameters I put in. So latitude and longitude for uh, for Fort McMurray. Um, you can look at your skin type. There's six skin types. So I figure I'm type two, I guess. I'm pretty pale. I'm not as pale as some, but um, I think type two is, says uh, burn easily, uh, tan a little bit. So I figured that was me. Um, uh, and midday exposure to sun. We talk about body exposure, so I, I put 10%. I bet you it's actually probably less than 10% at this time of year when I have a tooth on and everything like that. Overcast sky, you can choose the surface type. I don't know how that makes an effect. I guess sun will uh, you know, reflect. So I got different numbers when I put in snow versus new or old snow or concrete. And um, for, for this time of year, I got anywhere from 45 minutes to two and a half hours of sun of exposure I need to get those 600 units. So uh, in July, um, I figured, okay, I'll probably wear a t-shirt and shorts. Maybe 50% of my body is, is exposed and uh, you know maybe lawn. Again, there's different types of grass I could choose. <laughs> Um, but you know, one of the, I think that, I think I got anywhere from 20 seconds to two minutes when I kind of played around with these variables here. So you get the idea here, right? And of course, if you're wearing sunscreen, that's going to affect it. People with darker skin do not absorb 
um, the sun the same way. In fact, they absorb less sunlight and they're more at risk. And so they have to be have more um, sunlight in order to get the uh, appropriate amount of vitamin. So anyway, you can go, you can check out that link and, and play around a little bit. I don't know who programmed it and how accurate it is, but it kind of gives you an idea of what it looks like. Um, I saw, um, I found this through a, a vitamin D deficiency website, right? And they had it amped up so it makes it sound like you had to have six hours of sunlight. I don't know what they were doing, but when I put things in, I got two and a half hours. So anyway, question? Um, through the winter, what happens with the like tanning salons or things no, like that? No, or? like, so like boost your mood to like just bolster it with things like that. You know what, I have no idea. Um, I think for tanning lamps, you don't, you can make a little vitamin D, but not as much. Because tanning lamps are usually, they're restricted in terms of, of which, um, which exactly wavelengths of UV you're getting. Uh, you're not getting the whole spectrum. And so I think you can make a little bit, but not really that much vitamin D from tanning lamps. As opposed to the mood ones, I have no idea. I don't think they're even UV. I think they're just in the visible spectrum. Because if they were UV, that wouldn't be good. That's actually kind of dangerous to have those shine on your face and just damage your eyes and things like that, right? Um, but yeah, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, so tanning lamps, probably not so much. Maybe a little bit that way. Um, so what does this mean? This means in the winter, we need to be looking at getting vitamin D from our diet maybe. Or, or supplements. And again, depending on who you're talking to, some people are recommending supplements, some people are not. Uh, if you take a look, uh, here's the recommendations for, um, for vitamin D. I'd mentioned 600 units. Uh, by the way, with vitamins, let me see how we're out of time. With vitamins, um, often they talk about units rather than grams or milligrams or whatnot. Uh, and I'm not sure why they do that. Um, it's just it's just a thing. So you can see both recommendations on there. So I'm assuming we're all in this category here. Um, you know, unless somebody's pregnant, which is actually the same number, right? So there we go. I don't think anybody here is younger than than nine or older than seventy. Are we? Anyone? Anyone? I don't think so. Okay. Um, you can see a little bit less for kids. Um, as you're as you're getting a little older, uh, we're worried about uh, bones getting fragile and whatnot, and uh, and that's where those numbers come from. So this is a good area where the numbers all come from basically bone studies, right? And this is where the controversy is because people who say you need more vitamin D are saying, well, yes, that's enough if you want strong bones, but we want to have, you know, better immune system and, and a big long list of things. And they're saying that more vitamin D is needed for those other systems. And so that's where a little bit of the, that wiggle room, that gray area is in, in terms of, of uh, what they're talking about. So where do we get vitamin D from? Uh, we can get vitamin D from a whole bunch of things, but it turns out that that cool thing that happens to our skin where we make vitamin D, that, that milk can also do that. So I'm not exactly sure how they do it in milk, but so I think they hit milk with UV radiation and, and it produces vitamin D in the milk. So milk is fortified. And so once they started fortifying milk, um, I'm not sure when that was, like 100 years ago or something like that, uh, rickets started disappearing amongst children uh, in, in countries that did that. You can also get vitamin D from a lot of um, animal products. Um, so fish uh, in particular tends to be higher in vitamin D than say beef or, um, or pork or something like that. And you can see that cod liver oil apparently is, is kind of the number one thing. And I'm sure we all love eating that. I don't think I've ever had it in my life. Uh, milk products a little less, uh, like, like cheese is a little less, but just drinking actual milk is one, one area you can get from. I think I have another uh, chart here, yeah, okay. So the other thing I wanted to show you this here, is that vegetables and fruit, almost zero, unless you are buying something that is fortified. And so I've seen uh, orange juice that's fortified with vitamin D. And this is one of the things, if you're a vegan, that you wanna make sure you're getting adequate amounts of vitamin D for either supplementation or buying the products that are fortified. There's fortified soy products I've seen as well. Um, so that's something to think about. Uh, the other thing I was gonna mention, I noticed that was on a previous slide, is for infants that are breastfeeding only. So if the infant is taking formula, so formula that you would buy and feed your baby uh, is fortified with vitamin D. Breast milk has small quantities of vitamin D and it's probably not enough for the child in the winter months. So they recommend that if you have a breastfeeding infant in the winter months that you do give them a vitamin D supplement. Uh, and, um, and then besides that, 
again, you know, it's kind of a personal choice. I know some people who take vitamin D all the time don't take 10 pills, please. Um, I was looking at them. Um, I have some at home. I kind of remember maybe once a week to grab one. Uh, kind of when I feel like I'm not eating a lot of meat or when I'm not getting out much, I'll pop one, right? Um, but I was looking at it and the pills I have have 600 units per pill. The one pill is giving me my entire day's uh, recommended daily amount, right? Uh, I know some people take them regularly, religiously, um, and hopefully they're just not taking 10 or 20 at once, right? So one of those things that you're starting to see a little bit of recommendations around that because some people are concerned and uh, I meant to bring out, I was looking at a Canadian study looking at uh, deficiency in Canada, and I can't remember the exact numbers, but I think they estimate something like 20% of us might be in that kind of gray zone where we might be a little on the deficient end. Um, and most people are kind of in that okay zone with a few people kind of on the, on the other end as well. Okay, a few minutes left. Want to do a Kahoot? We'll do a Kahoot, okay. 